This video will take you from deep ecology to the history of early Russians in the Donbass. I did not watch news since the beginning of the war in Ukraine but did my due diligence in learning about the history of the eastern regions of Donbass and Luhansk. I am German and like most people in the West I knew little about the history in this part of the world. So watching the news would just be idle entertainment. And I can tell you it was surprising. The history of the Tatar raids in the wild fields and early Russian settlers securing, developing and defending the region for 1,000 years is epic. It is a true story of multi-ethnic migrants unifying for common values of freedom. These people were called Cossacks. Their history is one of courage, freedom, equal rights, unification, and century-long battles for stability in the region. Their history is inseparable from the Russian history. Cossacks were the special forces of Russia for centuries. Their struggle has never stopped and escalated last month to be the main global news. So, here is the short answer to who owns a country. Nobody. This planet is far far too valuable as if any group of people could assert ownership of a piece of it. Particularly not the surface, because here is where nature resides. Mankind expanding in a technosphere can move underground, vertical, onto the ocean, into the air and to space, but nature is bound to the ground and the water. In the future this might be different, but currently we cannot survive without nature and the various ecosystems on our planet are the foundation of our economy. We do not draw resources from thin air so far and we do not produce food and goods in closed cycles. This is by the way, my professional work. Check out the video about seawater farming. Okay. The question of ownership is rather one of stewardship. I think that a group of people can claim responsibility and special rights for a geographical area, they have been good caretakers of resources and a sustainable development for a long time in that area. This claim works only in connection with the percentage of that group to the overall population, democracy so to say. I think so because good stewardship for sustainability has no alternatives. Does this sound familiar no? Exactly. Political or religious claims to a homeland are as diverse as the individual cases and cannot be regulated by a set of rules. There is no universal set of rules or territorial claims. Not only because of the diversity of cases, but also the diversity of cultures, political systems and religions on our planet who do not agree on such issues. Not even a people who might have a claim can clearly be defined. Most nations are multi-ethnical by now and the further back in time we go the less certain we are about their origins and the less valid the claim for a homeland in the present becomes. Needless to say that this absence of definition and rules contributes to the global chaos. Now some historical facts. This is not the whole history, as usually presented, and these facts can also be interpreted from other perspectives. I picked facts that are useful for understanding who the Cossacks were. Respectively, the early Russians of the Donbass region. Number 1. History. Cossacks fought for the region of the Ukraine for centuries. The earliest record dates their presence back to the 10th century. The Donbass region became sparsely repopulate by Cossacks during the 14th century. During the 17th century larger groups of Cossacks began moving to the Donbass region for work. The Cossacks founded the first town in Donbass almost 350 years ago. The main work was coal mining. Donbass is the abbreviation for Donetsk Coal Basin. These Cossacks were the founders of Donbass as we know it. Many of them came from Russia. They were predominantly Russian Orthodox. Beginning from the 16th century the Cossacks, not only from the Don region fought with Russia. Descendants of these Cossacks can simply be considered Russian today. After Catherine the Great won the Russo-Turkish Wars, the greater area, called the Wild Fields until then, was incorporated into the Russian Empire in the 1780s and called New Russia. It had been raided for centuries by the Ottomans and the Crimean Tatars before. This was the main reason why the Donbass region could not develop earlier. So the Russians under Catherine the Great finally liberated the area. 
up to 72,000 Russian soldiers paid for the victory with their lives. When the industrial area began in the second half of the 19th century Donbass transformed into the most important coal producer in the greater region. This was achieved by the labor, suffering and early deaths of the Russian miners and of course the hard work of women managing households building society and much more. Imagine how you would feel about your private property if your entire family and ancestors had paid for it with their hard labor suffering and blood for centuries. In April 1918 Ukrainian troops took control of Donbass during the Second World War Hitler. Donbass was liberated from the Nazis by the Russians in 1943. Number 2. What do the people want who live in Donbass now? In 2010 Viktor Yanukovych, a Donetsk native, was elected president of Ukraine. But he was removed by a coup called the Ukrainian Revolution in 2014. The official reason is that he did not want to support the joining of the EU by Ukraine. The coup and earlier Euromaidan uprising are huge topics of their own, but one thing can surely be said. If the ousting of President Viktor Yanukovych had any legitimacy, then also the following breakaway of Donbass and Luhansk. Either the people decide, or not. So in 2014 the people of Donbass and Luhansk voted for the independence of the Donetsk People's Republic and the Luhansk People's Republic from Russia with 90% in favor. The Donetsk People's Republic was formed on April 7, 2014. Number 3. What do politics want? The Ukrainian parliament obviously wanted to sign the association agreement with the EU. If they have been manipulated into it by NATO or lured by the promise of economic gain does not matter. The activities of lobbyists and the interests of Western arms dealers dilute the meaning of politics. To make it short the political theater is not to be mistaken what the people want. Whether President Viktor Yanukovych supported the agreement at the beginning or changed his mind after learning about the economic implications is unimportant and of no meaning for the case of Donbass and Luhansk. We should also not forget that there is another level even behind the economic powers making and breaking governments and that is the invisible global reign of private banks. We know they played both sides of wars before to make a profit or to take over the control of a country. How much the Ukrainian government was played before 2014 and the people of Ukraine by Western media propaganda we might never know. Dear listener, there is so much more to know. Please feel encouraged to learn about the history of the Russian Cossacks and the nations and tribes of the Great Steppe. From all that I read there was nothing more of importance to the claim of Russia on the Donbass, surely the back and forth in Ukrainian politics, society and in the media are meaningless. Please consider finding an independent news organization and investigative journalists who are experts on the region. We all have a great responsibility to get educated and to invest our attention currency for truthful sources.